Oh my gosh. I was actually uh, having a problem with it. I mean, I used to have a class on Connect, but it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't this class. And when I put the code in, it was saying, I don't know, it wasn't letting me. For which code? For, the code. I bought the book at the bookstore and I have the code. And I've been trying to. For this class? For this class, yeah. Uh -huh. And it's not letting me. But like, I copied the link you sent and everything. Uh huh. So let's work on it after class. Okay. Yeah, that's why I wrote this. That's right. That's right. Okay. How about other people? Any, anybody else had a problem yeah. with it? Okay. There was one homework due, right? Okay. Yeah. Last weekend. And uh, I do believe the Learn Smart exercise for Chapter 2 is due this week. Okay. Are they graded? Huh? I'm graded one is due this week. And then the graded one is due next week. Okay, so you do want to register on Connect Drive as soon as possible. Okay, so if you have any difficulty, you can talk to me right after this class. Okay. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to start with chapter two. Okay, chapter two talks about the supply and the demand. Okay, so this is something that you actually can you feel familiar with. No. So today, first, I'm just going to go over the concept you have learned before. And then, and um, then we're going to go and go much deeper. Okay, on supply and demand. Okay. First, let me ask you. Thank you. Much. No, just black. <laughs> okay, this one. Thank you so much. Okay, so first I want to ask you, what is the name curve? What is the name curve? So that, let me draw the demand curve here. Okay, so what is the label on the vertical axis? Price. It's a price. Price of goods. How about the horizontal axis? So demand curve has a negative slope or positive slope? Has a negative Negative or positive slope? Negative. 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 So it describes what? Describe what kind of relationship? The price for that, that given quantity. Say it, say it louder, I could not the, hear you. The price that given quantity. Describe the relationship between the market price and the quantity demand. Well, as, huh? as price goes up, the quantity demand is less. Okay. So describe the relationship between these two variables while holding all other variables constant. So the last part of this definition is very, very important. In order to describe the relationship between these two variables, market price and quantity demanded, you have to hold all other variables constant. Because there are many factors affect the quantity demand, right? Okay. So later on, we're going to talk about those factors. So if you do not hold out those other factors constant, those factor, factors changing, then you will not be able to describe the relationship between these two variables. Okay. So that is very important. The relationship is a relationship between the market price and quantity demand while holding all other factors constant. So next thing I want to go over is the difference between demand and quantity demanding. What's the difference between these two? Demand and quantity demanded. Whenever I say demand, what do I mean? Isn't it like the demand as a whole? That's right. De whenever I talk about demand, I mean the relationship. I mean that curve. It's called demand. Okay? So whenever I talk about the quantity demanded, I mean it's a particular point along the curve or along the line. Okay, so that's the difference between demand. So what are the things that are going to cause the quantity demanded to change? Price. Price. 
potential price changes, quantity demand, quantity demand is going to change along the line, along the curve. How about demand? What other factors is going to affect this whole demand curve? Consumers have to spend more than spend, in theory. The so, more money they make, the more. So the higher the income is, the higher or lower the demand is. Higher. Yeah, well, not in every case, right? Normal good. Very good. We have to know what good is, right? Mm -hmm. So there's two different kinds of goods. What are they? Normal, normal, normal good and inferior good. Okay. If it's no more good, then know that when the income goes up, demand will go up. Okay. And if it's inferior good, and when the in, when the demand goes up, when the income goes up, demand goes up. And if demand goes up, how does demand shift? Shift to the right or shift to the left? Right. right. Shift to the right. Very good. Okay. So that's the first important factor. What is second important factor? Factor demand. Price of related good. Huh? Price of related good. What are the related goods? There's two different categories of related goods. Complement and substitutes. So if two goods are complements, then when one goods price up, what's going to happen to the other goods demand? It's going to go down, right? Okay. If two goods are complements, then when one goods price up, the other goods demand is going to go down. Okay. Everybody follows that? Okay. Do I need to go into example? And if two goods are substitute, and if one price, if one goods price goes up, what if what's going to happen to the other goods? Uh, demand. It's going to go up. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I use A to represent one good, I use B to represent the other good. Okay. If two goods are complement, when PA goes up, and the demand for good B is going to go down. And if they are substitutes. If the price of A goes up, the demand of good uh, of good B is going to go up as well. This is the second important factor we learned. What other factors that affect the demand as well? What other factors affect the demand as well? Income and the price of related goods are most to Different government policies, policy of tax policy, those things, you know, the pricing as well. Others? Expectations, right? Okay, if we expect there will be a big sale going on next month, our current demand is going to decrease. Okay. Expectation and the taste and preference. Okay, right now, iPhone is trendy, so everybody has to maybe in five years, some other product will be become fashionable. Right. So, taste and preference, expectations, and government policies, all this will go back. Okay. 
So I'm not going to list uh, all of them. There's um, tons of other factors that will affect the, the position or the location of this beam. So when we draw this demand curve between price and quantity, we're holding all these factors constant. So that's what we learned from the principal course. We learned how those factors affect the main curve qualitatively. Qualitatively. So we learned the qualitative effect of those factors on the demand. But this course, we're going to go deeper. So not only we need to know the qualitative effect, we want to know quantitative effect of those factors. impact of all those factors on the demand quantitatively I'm going to introduce you we call it demand function okay. what is demand function demand function describes the relationship between the quantity demanded I'm going to use QX to represent the quantity demanded. Okay. QX is represent quantity demanded. So demand function represents the relationship between this one and all other factors that affect the quantity demanded. So what are the all other factors? Okay. We're going to have this. This is quantity demanded. And Px represent the price of good x. Okay. Then I'm, we're going to have M represent income. And we're going to have Py represent the price of related good. And we have age represent all other factors. The value of all other factors. So demand function describes the relationship between Qx and all these variables. Okay. When we do not know the relationship between this variable and the all other variables, what we're going to do is we're going to use what we call the implicit function form. Okay. This implicit function form is this. This is what we call the implicit function form. Why? Because when you do not know the relationship, you're going to use f here. This f here represents whatever the relationship between qs and all other variables. When you do not know that, that's how we represent it. Okay. Inside this bracket represent all the variables that affect this variable quantity. And this relationship here, this function form here, can be any kind of form, can be linear, linear, can be any kind of crazy form. And the job for the economist is to figure out this relationship, figure out this function form. They collect the data from the real world. Then they use this data to derive this relationship, to de de derive this function. But for this class, this is not your job, okay? Your job is not to derive this function form between the quantity demanded and all other variables. Your job is to analyze the relationship when this f is given, okay? 
So let me give you a specific relationship between quantity Dinelli and all other variables. Economists have done their job. They figure out the relationship in the, between the quantity demand and all these four variables. And the relationship is like this. Okay. And you are the manager of this store. You are the manager of this um, business. And your job is to utilize this given relationship to decide whether you should raise the price or you should raise the advertisement expenditure. So here, H here, this other factor here, representing this particular example, represents advertisement expenditure. So instead of using H, I'm going to change it into AX because it just, um, this will look more like advertisement expenditure. All right. So I'm going to ask you a few questions here. By looking at this relationship here, can you identify whether this good is no more good or inferior? Oh. Next question. Can you identify this good Y is a substitute or complement of good X? Okay. So let's answer these two questions first. Does everyone know what I'm asking for? First, whether this good X is inferior or normal good. I did not tell you the good, because if I tell you the good, you would know whether normal is inferior. But I want you to use this relationship, this demand function, to determine whether it's normal or inferior. What's the definition of the normal good? When the income goes up, quantity demanded goes up. Okay. Is it the case here? Where which variable represent income? Uh, if all other variables values remain constant, remains the same. When M increases, what's going to happen to QX? Decreases. Why? Because there's a negative sign here. So it is an inferior. It's inferior. Because of negative sign in front of it. So the income and quantity demanded have, is correlated with each other negatively. So I'm, so this good X is inferior good. If here is positive, then you know this is no more good, right? Next question. Are X and Y complement and substitutes? Why substitute? The, the, the rare instance on the price. The sign the in front of it is positive. So which means when the price of the Y goes up, the quantity demanding on good X goes up. So they change in the same direction, right? So only when the two goods are substitute, the P1, QX change in the same direction. So this function form tells us X and Y are substitutes. Question. So it's, it's basically an assumption. So if PY is positive, then we can automatically assume quantity would be positive as well. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. Okay. Ask the question here. So if if PY is positive, 
like that. You mean the sign in front of PY yes. is positive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can assume that quantity of demand will be positive or will go up. Uh, we don't have to assume. We know for sure. It, we know for, we sure. Know for okay. sure. Okay. We know for sure. If the sign here in front of this PY is positive, when this goes up, while other things remain constant, mm -hmm. this will go up for sure. Okay. Yeah. So if you forgot the concept on the uh, inferior normal good substitute complements, come come to me after class because those are concepts you guys learned from principal class and I don't want to spend time to go over those and we also have tutor to help you guys. Okay. So that took question answered. Next question I'm going to ask you is a very simple calculation question, right? And I want you to. Calculate quantity demanding when those values are given. I'm giving you Px is equal to 200, Py is equal to 15, M equal to 10,000, and advertised expenditure is 2,000 as well. It's a simple calculation. Okay. So I want you to do this simple calculation to figure out what is quantity demanded. Is it a 15 right here, person? Yes. PY yes. is 15. This is 200, 15, 10,000, 2,000. This course is hands-on course, so you will have to do a lot of calculations in the classroom. Yes. What's that P of Y? Huh? Is it say 45? What's that? Um, price of the lady is 15. Okay. Louder. Is it 5,460? 5,740. Negative. See, that's why I want you to do calculation. I mean, I don't know if I could read all the numbers right either. A of X is 2,000. Another one's 200. 200. So that means we have 200 plus plus 60. What? So no. what is the final answer? 5740? Negative? 50. Na no, it's 54. <laughs> How many different answers do I have? A lot. <laughs> 
Okay, so five full. Five full sixty. Is that correct answer? Yeah. I hope so. Okay, that's what you got. Do I need to go over this? Yeah. So I recommend you to do this, okay? Do each one differently, then plug back in and calculate the final answer here, all right? All right, so next question requires a little bit critical thinking. <laughs> now I give you all this information here, this function form and all these values. Now I want you to draw the demand curve. Draw the demand curve. Do you know what demand curve is? How do we How do we do it? Draw the demand curve. accurately draw this demand curve using the information above. So it would be 15 for, for the P? 15 for the PY? Or PX, it would be PX, right? 200? So what do we do now? You guys? That's a good question. What do we do with this? We are going to draw. Sure we take, don't know the PX. You no. take that or. Do I have to say the louder? We, um, we pretend we don't know the PX and the QX. We only leave one variable's value out. It's PX. Because PX. variable here we're going to draw. We don't need a specific value of it, right? But however, we need all the values for all other variables. Remember that definition? The main curve is a relationship between the Px and Qx when all other variables hold constant. And do we have all other variables values? Yes, we do. So we plug all this value back into here then that means we're holding all these values constant. Once we've done that, then we're able to draw this demand. So, in order to draw this demand, we leave this at this, but we put plug all the rest of value back into this. And go ahead and do this calculation. Tell me what do you have, what do you end up with? What is the simplified? What is a simplified demand function here? What is simplified demand function is? Simplified demand function only have Qx and Px, no other, ver other variables. Q 
2 i is equal to, do you get it? Anybody else get it? The function? Did you guys understand what I'm asking us to do? Not exactly. Okay. So you leave Px as, as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you plug this 15 right into here. You plug 10,000 right into here. You plug 2,000 right into here. So, so eventually you're going to have a new demand function with only these two variables in it. So can you just add 12,000 to 5460? You 12,000 plus 60 minus 10,000 plus 4,000. Okay, so it's negative 3px and then times 6,060? 60, 60, yep. Yeah. Okay. So it's 60, 60 minus 3px. Okay, everybody got that? That's what we call the simplified demand function. Simplify demand function. Why do we derive that? Why do we derive that one? Plug in price. Then we can utilize this and draw the demand now. Okay. So now can you tell me what is the value? You know this is a linear form, so it's going to be a straight line. And uh, it's going to have negative slope, so there will be a point that cross vertical axis, and there will be a point cross the horizontal axis. So what is the value here? 60. 60. 60. 60. Is it 60, 60? Yeah. Yeah. Price is zero. What does the point along the vertical axis mean? That's the problem. That's the problem. That's a the Qx is equal to zero, oh. right? When Qx is equal to zero, you solve this Px, what Px equal to? 2020. 2020. So did everybody follow me that? To figure out the point along the vertical axis, you have to make Qx equal to zero. How do we find the point along the vertical uh, horizontal axis? Make Px zero. Make Px equal to zero. Then when Px equal to zero, what is Qx equal to? 660. 660. And we know this is a linear line, so we just so this is the demand curve based on this function, demand function, and all those informations. Any one of those variables value changes, this demand is going to shift. Right? But while we're holding those constant, that's the location of the demand. So it was uh, to find to find uh -huh. the px point. You set px to zero. Which point? You're talking about this point. Yeah. P? I'm talking about that 2020 right there. 2020. Okay. Set PX so this zero. point it along the vertical axis, right? So which means the value for qx is equal to zero okay. for that point. So you plug zero into this here. Plug zero into here. Then you solve px, which is equal. Wouldn't it be negative 2020 since it's negative 3? Mm -mm. okay. Zero is equal to 60, 60 minus 3px, right? So you're going to move this 3px to the other side. The px equals 20. So in the homework, you're going to have a question just like that. So you're going to practice the calculation just like this. Any other question here on this? To be familiar with, you need practice. This is what's homework for. So, what we call this method here is two point method of drawing in the end curve. Two point is this point and this point. First, is you make Qx equal to zero, you find 
this value here. And then you make Px equal to 0 from this point. So this is called two point method. So we call this is a simplified domain function. Which is Q x is equal to 60, 60 minus 3. So next, I'm going to introduce to you the inverse domain. Function. Inverse domain function. The inverse domain function is using variable qx to represent px. So we want to change, change the position of two of these variables. We want px on the left hand side. How do we do it? Just like the way we did it here. Okay, you're going to move this three PS on the other side. And move QX to the right hand side. Okay, so in this case is we have three X is equal to 60, 60 minus QX. Then what we have here is Px. We're going to divide 3 on both sides. It's 20, 20 minus Qx divided by 3. This is what we call the inverse domain function. So given a general domain function form, and also some values, the values of some variables, you will be able to derive the simplified demand function and also the inverse demand function. Okay. And also be able to draw the demand curve. So now I'm going to say one of the factors value has changed. Okay. And this variable here is the income. Question four. Now suppose income has increased by a thousand dollar. So you know how this demand is gonna shift, right? How this demand is gonna shift. Shift to the right or shift to the left? To the left. To the left, because it is mm -hmm. inferior yeah, good, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And um, you should be able to know the, the magnitude of the shift as well. Okay, so what you do is you add a thousand dollar to this whole thing here, right? Then the new demand function, new simplified demand function would be Qx minus what? Not, not, you know, add a thousand dollar. Actually, you're going to deduct one thousand dollar amount, okay? So this will be five thousand sixty dollars minus three, three Px. So you will be so this value here will be 50, 60, 60, okay? And this value is whatever, 50, 60 divided by 3. And these two lines as parallel to each other, right? So that's straightforward. But what I want you to do here is this. Suppose you're the manager, okay? And you go here is to maintain the same level of the quantity demanded. So your goal here is to re make this demand curve remain the same, to not shift that. But right now there's something going on. The income has increased by $1,000. But you still want this 
the demand curve remain the same. So you're going to, in order to make this demand curve remain the same, so you're thinking about changing the advertisement expenditure to offset the effect from the income. So how do you do it? You know the income increase is going to have some negative impact on the quantity demand. People are going to buy less of that. Right. But you don't want to have them. So, so you want to increase the advertisement expenditure to offset. Increase it by 500? Hmm? Would you increase it by 500? Why? How do you, how do you get that? Because when you plug it in, it's going to, you have to multiply it by 2. That's right. So the change from the income here is a... A thousand? Decrease a half. That's all that, right? Okay. So if you want to use a change from here to offset that, and the change from the advertisement expenditure has to be... Equal to a thousand, right? This change here multiplied by 2 because there's 2 in front of it has to be equal to a thousand, right? So the change has to be 500,000. Are you guys following me on that? Okay. So by increasing advertisement expenditure by $500 more, you're able to maintain the same level of quantity demanded. You offset effect from the income. So everybody is comfortable with this calculation here? Okay. All right. So this question here captures um, almost everything I want to talk about for the demand the function. So next, we still stay with demand. The next concept I'm going to talk about is still on the demand side. Remember when we talk about the demand and supply, we really kind of, when we talk about demand, we isolate the supply out. We're not considering the supply side at all, okay? And when we talk about supply later, we're not considering demand. But later on, we're gonna combine these two and uh, analyze the equilibrium. But when we talk about demand right now, we're not really considering supply at all. Okay, we're isolating these two sides of the market. The next uh, thing I want to talk about is consumer surplus. Consumer surplus also is a concept from the demand side. What do you mean consumer surplus? So that means that you get you get too many products. Okay, let me give you an example. I don't know printing. You want this printing for fifty dollars. So which means you think this printing worth fifty dollars? You're willing to pay fifty dollars for it. You look at this printing. You think it's uh, worth small. You think it's worth one hundred dollars. You're willing to pay one hundred dollars. Okay? And for you, you think it's only worth $30. So you go. The maximum amount of money you're willing to pay is $30. Right. So I bring this painting, then I say, okay, the price of this painting here is $60. Assume in this market only three of you. Who is going to buy this painting? Remember, she, she he's the only one, okay. right? You two are not going to participate. Why? Because your valuation of this painting is lower than the market rate. Right. And his valuation of this painting is greater than the market rate, so he's going to participate. So he's the only one who's going to get surplus from this consumption. Mm -hmm. What is surplus? He valued this painting at $100, okay. but he got it for $60. $40 is his surplus. If we have multiple people participate in this 
market, then we add up each person's surplus, and that's what we call it, consumer surplus. Okay. So it's a difference between your own valuation and market price you pay. For all the people who participate in the market. Okay. So that's the meaning of consumer surplus. So we're going to use this example to analyze consumer surplus here. This is the mean curve. Now I'm going to give you a new interpretation of the demand. We already know demand represents the relationship between price and quantity, demand. But now I'm going to give you a new interpretation. And this new, inter this new interpretation will help you calculate consumer surplus. So now I assume Along this demand line, there's infinitely number of individuals. And each point there represents a different individual. And the corresponding value for each point represents that individual's valuation. Let's see. If I pick the individual here, Corresponding vertical value of this is 10, 10. So that means if this individual is John, then John's valuation of this object is 10,010. So that's the new definition or the new interpretation for the demand curve. Each individual point represents a different individual in the market and whose valuation is different. And it's represented by the value, corresponding value, on the horizontal, on the vertical axis. So we have the number of people. Here, let's say, N. Okay. Now I'm going to set the market price. And the market price is set right here. Tell me, in this market, who are the individuals that are going to participate and who are the ones that will not participate? John above. For all these individuals here, going to participate, right? Because their individual valuations are higher than the market price. So if they buy, they're going to gain a surplus. Each one of them. Those guys, they're not going to participate. So the surplus only come from those people. Let's look at N. And the corresponding for N here is the value in between these two, which is what, 510? can check my calculation. 15, 15 should be the midpoint between 10, 10, and 20, 20. If I were you, I would check. <laughs> Alright. So let's suppose there's an valuation of this object. Then what's N surplus? It's a difference between this and this, right? This distance here. If I pick another individual right here, let's say this is uh, Kim. Kim right here. And then we know for Kim, the surplus for Kim or her is this distance here, right? For each point along this part of the curve, this distance here represents this person's surplus.
mean if we want to add the surplus of everyone in this market? And over this part. Then it is just this triangle area. Right? So graphically, that triangle area represents the consumer surplus of all the individuals who participate in this market. Their gain from consumption, from buying of this product. So that's how we derive the consumer surplus graphically. Now, can you calculate mathematically the area of that triangle? How do we do it? So one half times base times height. It's base multiply height divided by two, right? Okay. So this is the base. Do we know this value here, base? Yes. yes. What is it? Isn't it 30, 30? No. The base represents the distance from here to here. 30, 30. Yeah, 30, 30. Find that? The Good. mass 60, 60 by 2? Yeah. You have to find this value here, and it is this distance here, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Somebody mentioned how to find it. How do I find this value here? Mass 60, 60 by 2? Yes, you can do that. It's true. Because, you know, since this is the midpoint, and this should be the midpoint too, right? And thus, this is the main point as well. Okay, so that's simple. And uh, but the uh, the formal way of calculating is what? Put the ten ten into the function. That's yes. That's that's write down our original demand simplified demand function, right? Okay. In this demand function, you have q x and p x, and look at this point here. We are looking for the quantity for this point, but we already know the price for this point, which is 1010. 10. So we're going to plug 1010 10 right into here. Right into here. Then the value we found is right here. Everyone follows the procedure here? So this is 30, 30. If you don't understand my handwriting, let me know. This is 30, 30. So this is the base of the, the length of the base for this triangle. And we also need to know the height. What is the height here? The difference between this number and 2020, right? Which is 10, 10. Then we'll have to divide by 2. That is the consumer surplus. When the market price is equal to 10, 10. How how do you feel about this calculation here? Are you comfortable? Okay. This way that I can find a, a no chapter problem for so you to practice here. the textbook do you you don't have some of you have it some of you don't. some of you have not, not open it so do you have it or you just you did not bring it with you have not okay so it's coming okay 
I have the online one. Like, do I need to bring my laptop in for class? Well, you need to bring your textbook. Okay. If you, you can print it out, you know, mm. print it out, and you all bring your laptop, but you need it, okay? okay? I want you to look at page 70. Page 70 and the question 5. A simple exercise, okay? Question 5. The question 5 gives you a simplified mean function. If you don't have the book, then just uh, read it over here. Simplified demand function is 300 minus 2px. Okay? They ask you to ca calculate the consumer surplus if the price is $45. Then they ask you to calculate consumer surplus when the price is equal to $30. And the third question is, ask you when the price decreases, what's happened to the consumer surplus? But the first, they ask you to calculate the inverse demand function too. Okay. So before that, they also ask you. I want you to do it right now, here, on your notes. First, given this, derive the inverse demand function, then calculate consumer surplus and for these two different prices. In order to figure out consumer suffer, you do need a graph. Okay. So you do need to use a two-point method to figure out the value here and figure out the value here. The graph is everything for supply and demand. Graph will help you to figure out which area.
work on it. I'm going to work on it. Okay. okay, first you draw the ground. Okay, not the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. you want more when you have more money uh, like a nice stuff uh, and you feel good is good that I call it that so some, uh, um, yeah the uh, when you have more money you want less of it yeah that's Accurately. No, this is not accurately. Okay. Don't you times it by three though? Like you did there? I did it 20 20. Okay. So when QX and equals 0, that's the equation. Then you have to draw the graph. Do this
still look confused. No, I got that part. I got, got that? Okay. So this is 150. And then this is the point right here, which I call point A. So now we need to look for the point along the horizontal axis. Okay. So we need to plug Px0, Px equals 0, right into here. When Px equals 0, what is equal to? Zero. zero. Right? Zero. Right? Yes? When Px equals 0, this is equal to 0, right? And Qx equal to what? 300. This is, I know, I think if you get this, this is straightforward, really straightforward, but if you have not got it, then come talk to me. You need to get this before you can move on to the other stuff. If you're not able to draw the graph, then the rest of the work is finished. This is important, okay? I still see some of you are not fully getting this graph here, how to get it. So nail this down, okay? Do not wait until too late. Okay, so this is the demand. Now we're looking for the consumer circles when Px equal to 45. Where is the 45? Let's say 45 right here. Okay. And we're looking for this area here, right? We need to know the base, which means we need to know this value here. Okay? How do we find this value right here? <coughs> trying to set up tutor for this course. This graph here, if you feel very, very difficult because graphing is this. If you get it, you forever get it. But if you did not get it, then this it can be very, very challenging. So this week your job is to get this graph understood. Okay? So I'm trying to set up tutor here and once I know the hour I'll let you know let you guys know and go to your tutor at my office house and nail this down. Okay. So this is 210. So which means this is the base, the length of the base. Now how about the height? How about the height? And the difference between this and the one this this value and this one is 95. So the area of this is 95 multiplied 210 and divide by 2. And that is consumer surface of this, when Q, P is equal to 45. Okay. 
and then you plug, then you do the next excess PX equals 30, it's uh, for the same procedure. Do I run out of time? Yeah, so it's not all five. One of five. One of five. This is 105? Yeah. No, no, the, the difference is 105. Oh, yeah, 105. I'm sorry. Good, good, good. Yes. 105. So, what is value here equal to? So, 1,025. Like that? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, 11,025. And 25. Yeah, not 200. Okay. And for the next one, PX equals 30, you plug this back into here, and what you'll find is what? Will be 300 mi minus 2 multiplied 30. This is 60. So here the value you're going to change into 240 and this is 30. Okay? Right. Okay, practice, practice. And if you have any questions, okay, next class we're going to continue this chapter and finish the slide and